Good day, Grade Twelves. Welcome to our next lesson in mathematics. In this lesson, we're going to carry on with looking at inverse functions and functions and examples of functions. If you were with me yesterday, I mentioned a question that I thought there was a tough one, and I said I would go and look it up. Well, I spent about 45 minutes last night looking up to find out where that example came from, and I'm terribly sorry to say I cannot find it. So we're going to assume that it was a typo, and if I come across it again, I will happily go through it with you guys and show you how to do it. But I did find replacement questions, quite a few of them, which are just as good, if not better. So we will be doing them today. So if this is the first time you're joining us, I would really like to urge you guys to join our grade 12 mathematics class. That way you guys can ask me questions, you can send me examples, or you can even ask for sections. We've had one or two students that requested that I do circle geometry a couple of weeks ago. So we spent a couple of weeks doing small well, couple of lessons, or actually I think it was about a week and a half doing circle geometry. And now we've moved on to functions. So guys, this is what it's supposed to be about. It's supposed to be a, um, obviously it's me teaching you guys, but it's also supposed to be interactive. Ideally what I'd like to do is teach you a section and then give you guys a multiple choice question set, not multiple guess, and it's anonymous. I don't know who answered what. I just get an indication of how many people got a certain question right or wrong. And what that would do is give me an idea whether or not you understood that type of question, and then I could uh, teach to that question. I could say, okay, fine, you guys obviously don't understand question three. Let's go through it and make sure you understand it. So that's what the whole idea is behind these lessons eventually. So feel free to join us. It is anonymous, um, or you can put in any name you want. Let's put it that way. Um, and I'm not going to be checking on you. I'm not going to go, hey, John, where were you yesterday? Because I can't tell. Okay, so it's very much up to you guys. Okay, so enough about that. Let's carry on with our lesson. So the first question is on some log graphs because we were doing exponential and log functions yesterday. So I thought we'd get carry on with that. So it says the figure below shows the curve of F, which is the red one, described by F of X, if you can't see it, it is a bit small, f of x is equal to log x base m, okay, as well as its inverse, that's the blue graph, and it's got a point a, which is 8, 1, 5, or 3 over 2, is a point on the curve f, and b is intercept of f, okay. Right, now, first question says, show that m equals 4. They want us to prove that this value here is 4. So what we could do, as we would with any of any graph, is we could just substitute values in. We know that y is log x base m. That is what we're saying, right? Do you agree we have this point here, 8 and 3 over 2, and it's on this graph here. Yeah, it's on the y equals log x base m. So I'm going to substitute that in. So the point is 8, 3 over 2, which is the x value and the y value. So therefore we can say that 3 over 2 is equal to log 8 base m. Okay, do you agree with that? 3 over 2 is equal to log 8 base m. So now what we can do is we can solve for m. And that's kind of the reason why I was going through your exponential and log rules in the last couple of lessons was so that you guys could understand how to switch these around. And what it is, is m to the 3 over 2 is equal to 8. It's m to the 3 over 2 is equal to 8. So now what we need to do is solve for m, and now we can just use our basic exponential rules. Do you agree that 8 is the same as 2 cubed? Okay, so I can say that m to the 3 over 2, and I'm doing this slowly, just to make sure you understand what's going on, is 2 cubed. Right, now I want to get rid of this exponent. To get rid of this exponent, I'm going to multiply this all to, to by the power of 2 over 3. 
what I do to the one side, I have to do to the other side. So I'm going to multiply this by the power of 2 over 3. But what is the rule? The rule is that we can just multiply across the brackets. That's why we're doing this. Because 3 times 3, we're going to cancel those, and we're going to cancel those, and we're left with m to the 1, which is just m. And then remember, this is an implied 3 over 1. So therefore, this cancels with that, and you're left with 2 to the power of 2, which equals 4. Yay! So we've just proven that m equals 4. And guys, just substituting it in, going, oh, well, log 8 base 4 is equal to 3 over 2. That doesn't work. You can't do it like that. You have to do it like this. Okay, so we've just proven that m equals 4. Now let's move on to the next part of the question. Now it says determine f to the negative 1 of x. So what are we trying to do? We're finding the inverse of this. We want to find the inverse of this. So how do you find inverses? The original graph, f of x, equals y equals log x base 4. We've just said that. When you're finding the inverse, what do we do? We swap your x and y, and then you solve for y. And that's what we're going to do now. So the first thing we're going to do is swap the x and y. So we're going to go x equals log y base 4. And then we're going to solve for y. So it becomes 4. Remember, it's 4 to the thing. 4 to the x is equal to y. So there you go. So therefore, this is equal to 4 to the power of x, which is an exponential graph. Okay, happy with that. Okay, next it says, find the equation g of x if g is a reflection of this in the y-axis. In other words, if I had to draw it, do you agree that this if it's a reflection in the y-axis, it means that it's going to look something like this. It's going to be the mirror image. This, was, this would be the mirror image. So this is going to be equidistant. Okay. So what is happening there? Do you agree that all that's happening is that the x values are becoming negative? Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. If this point here was, say, I don't know. Um, if x is 2, it's going to be 16. So if this point here was 2, this was going to be 16. Yeah, we're saying if x is minus 2, we're still getting the y value of 16 because it's a mirror image across the y-axis. So the only thing that's changing is the x value. Therefore, we can say that g of x is just going to be 4 to the negative x. Okay, let's see if that works. Let's say I plot in this minus 2. If I do that, we've got g of minus 2 is going to be 4 to the minus, minus 2, which is 4 squared, which equals 16. Ta-da! So you see that that does work. So all you have to do is think about what is becoming, what is changing. And what is changing here is that the x is changing from being a positive x to a negative x, positive x to a negative x. Okay, next question. Now it says, write down the coordinates of B, this point here, okay, the intercept of F in the x-axis. Okay, so we want to know, I don't want to erase everything I don't need, but I've got space to write. Okay, and let's just make that neater as well. Okay, there we go. That's better. Right, so we want B and they want to know what is the coordinates of B and they're just asking you to write it down. And that's because they're expecting you to know it. And how would you know it? Well, if this is an exponential graph, do you agree that this point here has to be X is naught, Y is one? Okay, because anything to the zero is one. But if these are inverses, then do you agree that all that happens is that x and y values have to swap, which means that this has to be 1, 0. So even if you didn't know that all our graphs go through 1, 0, you could work it out by the fact that it is the inverse of this exponential graph. Next it says, 
if point C, if C is a point, or zero, yeah, C. Yeah, sorry. There's C, four zero. And C D is perpendicular to the x-axis for D da, da, da. Calculate the distance C D. So they want the length of C D, but what do they really want? They're saying if the x value of this is four, what is the y value? If the x value of this is four, what is the y value? And that's pretty easy to do because we can just substitute into this equation because we know that f of x is equal to log x base 4. Okay, so therefore y is equal to log of x base 4. We're just writing it out so we're used to seeing it. But what is x in this case? It's 4. So this is log of 4 base 4. Therefore, y is equal to 1. Now, you should know this because I showed it to you in our lesson yesterday, that log anything to the base of the same thing is equal to 1. But if you didn't know that, but you knew how to convert, do you agree you could have gone 4 to the y is equal to 4? you have gone 4 to the y is equal to 4, okay? And this is an implicit 1 there, therefore we could say y equals 1. So therefore, the length of CD is one unit. Okay, it's pretty obvious that the length, I wrote this in the wrong place, sorry. The length of CD is one unit. Okay, now it says, okay, now it says, H of X. H of X is equal to A, three to negative X plus Q. Oh, there's H. I was wondering why we suddenly had an H. Okay, H of X, there we go, there's H there, okay? H of X is equal to A times our 3 to the negative X plus Q. Okay, now what's interesting about this is this is a negative exponential graph. So what should happen is that it should have an asymptote of the x-axis, it shouldn't cut the x-axis, but do you see it actually is cutting the x-axis and it's going all the way down and its new asymptote is minus two. So what has happened is this graph has actually moved down two units, okay? So do you agree that Q is obviously then minus two? So we can immediately go, well, this is obviously A, three to the negative x minus two. There we go, there we go. Okay, so that's minus two. And this is y. Now we want to find out the value of a, but we've got another point that h has gone through. It has gone through the point 0, 1. So when x is 0, y is 1. So using that, we can find a. So we can say 1 equals a 3 to the minus 0 minus 2, but that's actually 3 to the 0, and anything to the 0 is 1. So we've got 1 is equal to a minus 2, therefore 3 equals a. Ta-da! Okay, so there you go. That's how to do this question, which seemed totally unrelated to the others. Okay, let's do another question. So now we've given the parabola g of x is equal to 4x squared minus 6, and f of x is equal to 2 root x. Okay, which is obviously a parabola that has been flipped and only halved. Okay, so here is g of x. I'm just drawing this so we know what we're doing so we can see it. That's g of x. Okay, and g of x equals 4x squared minus 6. And then this other graph is f of x. And f of x is equal to 2 root x. Okay, that's f of x. Yeah, I'm going to also just make it red so you can see what we did. Okay, it just makes it easier. Now it says the graph is sketched below. S is the x intercept of g. K is the point on O and S is straight line QP. Da, da, da. Okay, let me read it properly. The straight line KQT, QKT, with Q on the graph of F and T on the graph of is parallel to the y-axis. Okay, so that's important. So let's pull that in. Okay, so this is parallel to this. 
Okay, now let's see what else guys. First thing they say is determine the coordinates of S correct to two decimal places. They want to know where does this cut the x-axis, do you agree? So as soon as you know that you need to find something to two decimal places, if this is a normal trinomial, I would say we're going to use the quadratic formula, but in fact, this is not a normal one, so we can just solve. We want to know where y equals naught. Do you agree? Naught, y equals naught here. Yeah, this is going to be x naught. And this is also going to be negative some random x1 naught. So we can say that y is equal to 4x squared minus 6. That's the equation we're using, but we're going to let y equal naught to find the x coordinate of s. If we've got 0 is equal to 4x squared minus 6. Now we're going to solve for x squared, well for x. So we've got 6 is equal to 4x squared. Therefore, x squared is equal to 6 divided by 4. Yes, I am doing so. If you guys want to do it faster than this, it's fine with me. Now, now you have to be careful because x is plus or minus the square root of 3 over 2. Okay, and now we need our calculus because it's just corrected two decimal places. So, if we do that, we want the square root, the square root of 3 over 2, that's not going to work, 2 equals... 1.2247. Okay, now we're rounding off the two decimal places, which means we look at the third number after the decimal, and that's a 4, which is smaller than 5, which means 2 remains the same, so it's 1.22. So therefore, the answer is plus or minus 1.22, which means this value here is 1.220, and this value here is minus 1.22, Zero. Okay, now we've got those two. Okay, now I'm going to erase just this writing over here so we can make space for our next question. Okay, here we go. Next. Now it says write down the coordinates of the turning point of G. Okay, and it says write down. So what they're trying to say to you is you don't need to calculate it. We have G of X is equal to 4x squared minus 6. Now, this is actually using your knowledge of this. But I mean, okay, you could have already realized that by the fact that this is 1.22 and this is minus 1.22, that you could have realized that actually this is equidistant. So therefore, we could say the parabola has obviously got an axis of symmetry, which is the y-axis. So therefore, the turning point is going to be 0 minus 6. But let me just cover something quickly with you. Got y is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. This tells you if it's a happy or sad graph, and it tells you a gradient. This tells you where it cuts the y-axis, and this is in charge of moving it left and right. Okay, it's not exactly like that, but it's close enough, okay? So if you don't have a bx, it means that it's centered on the y-axis, okay? And therefore, your turning point is going to be wherever it cuts the y-axis, which in this case is 0 minus 6. Okay, moving on. Next. Next, it says, write down the length of QKT in terms of x. Okay, write down the length of QKT in terms of x, where x is the x-coordinate of k. So what are they really saying? They want us to take f of x and subtract g of x. That's what they really want. Because this would be the y value of q, okay? The y value of q minus the y value of t. That's what we're really saying. But f of x can be written as 2 root x minus g of x which is 4x squared minus 6. And you guys need 
to actually be careful about these brackets because if you leave them out, you might get the minus thing correct. So this becomes 2 square root x minus 4x squared plus 6. Okay, and that is the end of this question. Just for the record, the next question on this, the next sub question on this question was to work out the maximum of this. Okay, and that actually falls into differentiation. What you'd have to do is derive this and then solve for the x value, um, which we could actually do. So even though we haven't done differentiation and I haven't covered it with you, I think I'm going to quickly show you. So the next question was, what was the maximum, the value of x, the value of x for the maximum length? Okay, and as soon as you see the words maximum, then you know that you've got to derive. So therefore, if this, we could say that this is the length, okay, and we can designate it L, okay, then do we that L, we can get L dashed of X, but before we do that, we need to make this thing look nicer because we don't like a square root in front of something or behind something. So we're going to say that L is equal to 2X to the half, minus 4x squared plus 6. So if we want to derive that, if we want to find the first derivative, let's just do that in a different color. We could say L dashed is going to be 2 times a half, x to the minus a half, minus 2 goes to the front, so it becomes 8x, and the constant goes away. Because remember the rule for differentiation is if f of x, equals a x to the n, then f dashed of x is going to be a n x to the n minus 1. You bring this number to the front to multiply, and you subtract 1 from the exponent. Okay, so that becomes 2 times a half is 1, and so it's x to the minus a half minus 8x. And in order to find the maximum length, what do we need to do? We need to let this equal 0 for max, for max. So we're going to solve for x now. So let us erase all of this. Guys, don't freak out if I'm erasing this a little bit fast and you're going, wait, wait, I didn't quite, I was still copying it and I didn't quite, guys, you don't need to copy this stuff, okay? It is on the interweb. It's on the internet, okay? All you need to do is go through exactly the same steps that you use to get to watch this actual video and you will get your recording and then you can watch it to your heart's content over and over again you can even stop it you can pause it um and then you can look and see what's happening and then you can carry on okay so now i want to carry on with this question and i'm going to carry on with this over here okay so by the way you really shouldn't write two equals in the same line. So what we should have written is that L dashed of X equals naught for maximum, okay? Then we've got one over the square root of X because that's what X and minus a half, minus eight X equals zero. Okay, do you agree? So therefore you can say, or oh, let's, let's leave it as an exponent because it's probably gonna be easier now that I think about it. So we've got x to the minus a half is equal to minus 8x equals 0. So x to the minus a half equals 8x, okay? So do you agree we can both divide both sides by x? So we got x, when we divide, we subtract the exponent, so it becomes minus a half minus 1 is 8. So that becomes minus 3 over 2. Do you agree? So that becomes x minus 3 over 2 is equal to 8. To get rid of this, I'm going to multiply the whole of this by the exponent of minus 2 over 3. But what I do to the one side, I have to do to the other side. This is also minus 2 over 3. The minus cancels with the minus, the 3 cancels with the 3, the 2 cancels with the 2, and you just left with x. Then this thing here, 8 is what? 2 to the power of what? 8 is equal to 2 to the power of 3. 
all to the power of minus 2 over 3. And what did we use here? We multiplied across the bracket. So we're going to do that. It becomes 2 to the negative 2, which equals a quarter. So when x equals a quarter, this will have its maximum length. There you go. So for a question that wasn't actually on this, but I haven't, I didn't copy over. It's actually quite a nice question, okay? But it was differentiation and we hadn't actually strictly covered differentiation, which is why I didn't include it. Anyway, let's move on. Okay, so now we've got the next question. The next question is f of x equals log a to the x. I mean, log x base a, okay? f of x equals log x base a, a is greater than zero. It says you've got this point here, one third minus one is the point on the graph. Okay, cool. Now it says prove that a equals three. So you can see that there's kind of a little pattern here with the type of questions. By the way, these are all old exam paper questions. They're either prelim paper questions or they are um, exemplar questions from the different sections, I mean, different provinces or they are final exam paper questions, okay? So, f of x equals log x base a. So, do you agree that we could write that as y equals log x base a? And you want to prove that a equals three, but we've got this point here. So, this is x and this is y, and what we're gonna do is substitute in. So, we're gonna say minus one equals log and the x is a third, one third base a. Now remember we can rearrange this. So we can take that to the top and then it goes like that. So this becomes minus one. Let's try again, does not do that at all. It becomes a to the minus one is equal to one third. So do you agree I could write that as a to the minus one equals three to the minus one. Therefore these cancel and a is just three and I've proven it. Ta -da. Okay, so now that is great. And we've seen how we use that using the conversion between logs and exponents. But I want to just cover a log rule here. We've got that minus one is equal to log, but a third can be written as three to the minus one. Do you agree? Base a. But this rule, the log rule says that whatever this number is, the power can be taken to the front. So you've got minus one is equal to log minus, minus one is equal to minus log three base A. The minuses cancel, so you've got one is log three base A. And the rule is that log of anything base the same thing is equal to one. Therefore, your a has got to equal three. And I'm covering both just in case you guys know this better than you do this. So you can actually use both rules. Strictly speaking, logs is not in your curriculum. I keep stressing that. But you do need to understand them in order to be able to do your exponents and vice versa. So I like to go through it. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Now it says write down the formula of h, the inverse of f in the form y is equal to. Okay, so we want the inverse again. So we've got y equals log x base 3. That is the current function, which is your f of x. They want h, which is the inverse. So to get the inverse, what do we do? We swap your x and y and you solve for y. Okay, so let's do that. So we're going to go x is equal to log y base 3. And then remember how it works. 3 to the x is equal to y. Ta-da! That's our answer. So h of x is equal to 3 to the x. Okay, not too bad here. Right, so let's erase this. Moving on. Now it says, if g of x is equal to minus f of x, find the equation of g. Okay, so that's pretty easy because this is, okay, so we're saying that g of x is equal to minus log x base 
three. That's all it is. It's really that easy. Okay, right. You happy with that? Okay, do you agree that could also be written as log x base three to negative one, just for the record. Okay, next question says, write down the domain of G. Ah, okay. So let's think about this. This is F. This is F, right? And F domain is from the zero all the way across there. So the domain of F is X is an element of real values for X is greater than zero. Okay, that's the domain of F. Does the domain of G change that at all? Okay, what is going on here? All that's happened, let's go back, is that your G of X has become negative F of X. Okay, so what has happened? is actually the y values have changed, not the g x values. So the domain of g of x is exactly the same. It is going to be x is an element of real values for x is greater than zero. Okay. Now it says, determine the values of x for which f of x is greater than or equal to minus three. So they want to know when is log x base 3 greater than or equal to negative 3. Okay, so determine the values of x for which f of x is greater than or equal to minus 3. Hmm. Okay, so there are a couple of ways we can solve this. One of the ways that we can do this is we can assume that this is equal. So we could say, okay, we'll let this be equal for a minute, okay? So we can say, therefore, we can say three to the minus three is going to equal x, okay? Therefore, x is going to be one over three cubed. Therefore, x is going to be one over 27. So we know that that has to be at least 27 to be equal to minus three. Okay, so we're going that x, for it to be minus 3, this has to be at least 1 over 27. But do you see that this graph continues down this way? So therefore, we're talking about these values this way. So for which values will this be true? Well, it will be true for x is smaller than or equal to 1 over 27 but greater than zero, because it can never touch the y-axis because that's an asymptote. So from one over 27, our y value over there is gonna be minus three, and then it's gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller and closer and closer and closer to the y-axis, but it's never gonna to touch it. So this is true from here onwards. Okay, good, next question. It says the sketch shows the graphs of f of x equals a half to the power of x and g of x is equal to a over x plus p plus q. So do you see that we've got two different graphs here? We've got an exponential graph and we've got an hyperbola. Okay. Here is an exponential graph. We over there. Okay. And here is our hyperbola. We sorry for the sound effect. Sorry, sometimes I forget I'm not actually in class. Okay, and you'll notice that your asymptotes are over here. This, yeah, this solid line here, the solid black line and the solid X line. These are your axes. These dotted lines are your asymptotes. So both your exponential graph and your hyperbola have been shifted. Actually, your exponential graph hasn't been shifted, but your hyperbola has definitely been shifted. Now it says, what does it say? It says, B is the point of intersection of the asymptotes of G. Okay, thank you. A is the y-intercept of F. A is the y-intercept of F. Oh, that makes more sense. Sorry, I misread that entirely. This is F. I'm much happier now. This is F. Sorry, that makes more sense. And it, therefore it's cutting there. And if it's cutting there and it's this, what does it have to be? That value there has to be 0, 1. Ah, that's nice and easy then. 
A is the wine set of F. The graph of G passes through the origin. The graph of G, okay, that's also G. The graph of G passes through the origin. Passes through the origin, telling you something there. And they tell you that AB is parallel to the x-axis. Okay, so the first thing they want us to do is write down the equation of F in the form Y is equal to. So we need to find the inverse of this. Okay, so let's get done with that so we can move on to the rest of the questions. We know that f of x equals a half to the power of x. So therefore we can write this as y equals a half to the power of x. What do we want to do when we find the inverse? We need to swap the x and y and solve for y. So if x is equal to half to the power of y, so now what we're doing is we're doing the opposite of the logs, okay? So this time we've got log x base a half equals y. Think about it. Half to the y is equal to the x. Yes, it works. So there you go. That is my answer. Next, it says write down the domain of the inverse. Okay, so it's actually really easy because all we need to do is find the range of this dude. Because the range and the domain swap, okay? So if we find the range of the original function, it's going to be the domain of this. We don't even have to think about this horrible log graph. We can just look at the range of this. And here, this red graph is my f. And do you see the range is the y is an element of real numbers for y is greater than zero, okay? So therefore, obviously, the domain of the inverse is going to be x is an element of real values for x is greater than zero okay x is an element of real numbers x is greater than zero okay moving on now it says calculate the values of x if x time four times f of x plus one equals root two okay so let's think about this We've got 4 times f of x plus 1 is equal to root 2. Okay, so what they're saying is wherever we see an x, we need to now put x plus 1. Okay, so 4 times by a half to the power of x plus 1 is equal to root 2. That's what they're saying. They're saying that... Wherever we see an x, we now need to put x plus 1. So it's 4 times a half the power of x minus 1 is equal to root 2. Okay, so let's change this a little bit. Do you agree that we're actually talking exponents now? And we can do this so easily if we just think in exponents. You need to think in exponents. Okay, so do you agree that 4 is 2 squared? A half can be written as 2 to the negative 1, all to the power of x plus 1, is equal to 2 to the half. Okay, so do you see that actually now it's very easy to solve? Because we can easily find that value of x by just sorting this out. So let's do this. This becomes 2 to the 2. What do we do? We multiply across the brackets, so it becomes minus x, minus times the plus is a minus 1, equals 2 to the half. We've got a common base, so what do we do? We add the exponent, so it becomes 2 to the mm, 2 minus x minus 1. I'm doing it very slowly, 2 to the half. So therefore, we can now cancel the bases because we can ignore them because they're the same. So we've got 2 minus 1 is 1 minus x equals a half. Therefore, x has got to equal to a half. Ta-da! Okay, that wasn't too bad. Let's try another question. Now they want the range of G. Okay, well, what is the range of G? The G exists. Let's have a look at it. G exists all the way here from, remember, okay, by the way, guys, in case you always struggle, ever struggle with this, domain is the X values and range is the y values. And the way that I remember this, and I didn't mention this, I think, yesterday, was that g's have got this beautiful little loop, and so do y's. 
whereas the domain has got nothing below the line and neither does the X. And the way, that's the way I remember it, and it seems to work, so go for it. So they want to determine the range of G, so they want to know how far across the Y axis does G stretch. So do you agree it goes on and on and on and on for minus infinity, and it goes up, 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 up to this asymptote. Okay, it doesn't cross that line. Then it goes from this asymptote up, 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 all the way to positive infinity. So we could say the range of G, range of G is going to be Y is an element of real values, but Y cannot equal what? And this asymptote is one because they told us that A was the intercept of F and F is an exponent and exponent graphs always cut at one. So therefore Y cannot equal one. Another way to just prove it to you, a half to the zero is equal to one. In other words, if the x value is zero, y a half to the zero is equal to one, because anything to the zero is one. So if that value there is one, and therefore the asymptote is a value of y equals one. Okay. <sighs> okay, if h of x is equal to x plus 3, sorry, my mouth gets sore from talking after a while. If h of x equals x plus 3 is the equation of one of the axes of symmetry of G, determine the coordinates of B. Actually, you know what, okay, great, well, so we're running out of time. So what I have to suggest you do is you take a screenshot of this or pause it or whatever. Um, try this question for homework, okay? And then see if you can get it right. And then tomorrow we'll carry on from this and I will show you how to do H of X and whatever other questions we have. Right, I hope you have understood and have learned something in this lesson and I hope you join me tomorrow at exactly the same time for another lesson on maths. Have a great evening.